we've got an important week coming up, not least because two central banks will release their latest decisions on monetary policy, and there'll also be lots of company reports to study. First up on the macro front is the US Federal Reserve on Wednesday the 20th of March. According to the CME FedWatch tool, which you can access for free, markets are putting a 99% chance on interest rates staying unchanged at 2.5%, and the other 1% is looking for a cut, not an increase. Markets are also putting a roughly 75% chance on no change for the whole of this year, so economists and investors may now be focusing on the Fed's balance sheet and its quantitative tightening policy. This is, because, this is because Chair Jay Powell has strongly hinted the central bank will halt QT this year and stop the process of shrinking its balance sheet. So attention will be paid to whether Mr Powell gives some details on when the Fed will stop and at what level. Remember, the US central bank took its balance sheet from around a trillion of assets to four and a half trillion dollars and has so far reduced that to just 3.97 trillion. So it isn't going to get back to anywhere near where it started if it stops this year, as we can see right here, alongside also what it's done on interest rates so far. This begs two questions. One, what's the Fed so worried about that it feels it cannot continue to try and normalise monetary policy? It is, after all, doing fairly well with its twin mandates of employment and inflation. So what does it see that maybe we don't? Two, and if the Fed does stop tightening policy, is this a signal for stock markets and other risk assets to head off to the races again? That's what's happened so far this year for sure, but can it continue if the underlying fundamentals of economics and corporate earnings are as weak as the need to stop tightening policy suggests? Over to you. Now, the second central bank in action this week is the Bank of England on Thursday the 21st of March. Although Governor Mark Carney and his colleagues on the Monetary Policy Committee look destined to leave interest rates and quantitative easing unchanged at 0.75% and £445 billion respectively. Attention here will rest on the vote and whether we get another 9 to nil sweep to do nothing or whether a policymaker breaks cover and calls for an increase or a decrease in rates. That, however, seems pretty unlikely so close to the Brexit deadline of the 29th of March. On the corporate front, around half a dozen FTSE 100 firms are set to release results or provide a trading statement, and a lot more small and mid-cap stocks will be updating the market too. Names to note include Copper miner Antofagasta, online grocer come technology player Cardo, oil services group Wood, and online fashion leader ASOS on Tuesday the 19th of March. Then you've got cruise ship operator Carnival, Miner for Expo, and construction services and construction group Kier on the 20th. Retailers Next and Ted Baker, support services Turnaround Mighty, and another oil services specialist Lamprell on the 21st. And finally, engineering conglomerate Smiths on Friday the 22nd of March. But the company most likely to cause a fuss in the week ahead is DIY retailer Kingfisher, which is set to release full year figures on Wednesday the 20th of March. The company owns B&Q and Screwfix here in the UK and Castorama in France, while it actually operates in 10 countries across Europe, so the results could provide some useful insight into the current state of the British and European economies as well. As we can see here, the shares are down by around a third over the past year. A lot of the blame for that rests with the full year results of a year ago and then September's interims, both of which disappointed. This is the third year of Chief Executive Officer Veronique Laurie's five-year One Kingfisher plan, which has so far been hampered by product availability problems as well as soft target economies. When it comes to the numbers, analysts will be homing in on a few sets of numbers to make sure that the plan is still on track, and the first is sales growth. In an attempt to be helpful, the company reports three sales growth figures, total sales, total sales in constant currencies, and like-for-like -like sales in constant currencies. Analysts will, I suspect, look at the like-for-like -like number. At group level in the third quarter, sales fell again by 1.3% after an encouraging increase in the second period. Attention will then switch to the second batch of numbers. That's the regional trends that lie beneath the headlines. In the third quarter, the UK and Ireland were down by 0.7% year-on-year, France down by 3.4%, and 
and the rest were actually up by 1.6% on a like-for-like -like constant currency basis. I think it's fair to say that investors will be looking for marked improvement on all fronts. Analysts will then switch to the headline pre-tax profit number. Last year, Kingfisher made £683 million, and the consensus for 2018 calls for a drop to £662 million on an adjusted basis. In the year just begun, by the way, the consensus estimates for an increase to £756 million. The dividend, well, that's expected to come in flat at 10.82 pence a share, enough for a yield of around 5%. And once you've checked that out, keep an eye out for commentary on one Kingfisher, especially with regard to margins, costs and product availability, as well as share buybacks. Remember, the plan has got two ultimate key thrusts. First, generate a £500 million profit uplift over five years through higher operational efficiency across the brands, cutting costs and improving the digital offering. Second, an additional £600 million in capital returns above and beyond the regular annual dividend payments over the next three years. Thank you for watching and I look forward to seeing you next time.